This podcast is brought to you by Deepbridge Capital LLP. Deepbridge is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Please note that investments discussed are both illiquid and high risk and won't be suitable for all investors and should be considered as part of a diversified portfolio. The content of this podcast should not be construed as financial or taxation advice. We recommend investors seek appropriate professional financial advice. Any views expressed may no longer be current and may have already been acted upon. Welcome to this latest Deep Discovery podcast. My name is Andrew Aldridge. The purpose of these podcasts is to bring to life the people and the companies behind what we do here at Deep To that end, I'm delighted today to be joined by Mark Roger, who is CEO at Ibis Vision, a company within the Deep Life Sciences EIS portfolio. So Mark, great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, with these things, I always like to start at the beginning. So, uh, you know, can you tell us a bit about Ibis Vision, how it came to be and, and your kind of key objectives? Sure. Um, so Ibis Vision is um, a startup about 10 years in the making, mm-hmm. uh, but aren't they all in medical? Indeed. Uh, so the background to Ibis, the background to Ibis Vision, um, it was uh, started originally by a retired eye surgeon okay. who was quite frustrated with um, the way in which the testing software or the testing equipment at the time rather would interact with patients. Okay. Patients didn't like it. Um, the clinicians didn't like it, yep. um, and fundamentally it meant that they had to go back and retest. So he wanted to do something different. And um, the original original testing platform that we were looking at was something called VFT, Visual Field Test. Okay. And uh, trying to revolutionize the way in which that was done to, you know, basically get a better outcome for the patients and more accurate for the clinicians. Um, whilst the... Uh, the originator of the company is no longer with us on a day-to-day basis. Yep. The the whole idea of how can we improve this um, sort of access to eye care mm-hmm. for the patients remains at the, the core of what we do. And we started thinking, well, what if? What if with the software we could actually do more than that original test? Okay. And we could actually do as many tests as possible on one platform. Yep. And that's where we are today. So we have a, a suite of platform, uh, sorry, a suite of tests that are available on the platform now. Brilliant. So just kind of uh, yeah, layman's terms for me, the VFT, is that the one where basically it's checking the, the how fast to each side and up and down you can see when you're doing your eye test? Kind of, yeah. The best way to describe it is that uh, visual field test is the one where you put your head inside a box that's about yep. the size of a smeg fridge. Yep. Um, and you're looking for grey dots and you're pressing a clicker. That's the one. And a yeah. lot of people think it's a game. So they go, did I see one? And they'll click it. Or I yeah. think I should have seen one by now. So they'll click again. And that leads to false positives, yeah. false negatives. It's quite a lengthy test. If you get that wrong, you have to go back and do it again. Yeah. So no one really likes doing it. But it is perceived as the gold standard to this day. So try and say it's, uh, it's kind of ripe for disruption and kind of improving uh, first time results. Uh, You've got it. It's ripe for disruption. Yeah, totally. But it, as uh, as you can tell, uh, I'm quite used to doing eye tests with uh, with my vision. But anyway, um, so uh, what was uh, what was the background of the team then, and uh, and yourself before kind of uh, getting involved? So um, my my background's in software mm-hmm. and software technology. Okay. So managing running software companies. Yep. Um, predominantly in the uh, health and leisure space. Okay. Um, I have been involved on. I guess the deep bridge side of the table, I've been involved with tech investment funds. I've headed up M&A for a large software acquisition vehicle. And then um, uh, (laughs) fell into Ibis Vision by doing what my wife refers to as paying to go to work, which is (laughs) investing in a company and not actually getting paid by them. So that's how I started with Ibis Vision. I got hooked on the idea that we could do something different. Yep. Um, Invested a little bit of money and time and effort into the company. And then before I knew it, I was all in, became yep. the CEO. And, you know, five, six, seven years later, here we are. And you, you've never looked back whether you like it or not, I guess. But uh, I, I always look back. <laughs> no, I never look back. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. kind of the, the, the 10 years then you, you mentioned, kind of 10 years in the making in terms mm. of the research, etc. Kind of uh, the, the guys doing that, was that uh, you know, all clinicians or, or how did that come yeah. about? Yeah. To be fair, I don't think it's quite 10 years. It seems like it, though. I think it's about <laughs> six or seven. Um, and yes, the, the majority of our team are actually from uh, related space. So we have mm-hmm. some that have been involved in large pharma. Yep. Uh, we have a number that have been involved in uh, clinical technology innovation with devices. Okay. Some from uh, high-end sales in high-end global brands and uh, marketing. So uh, involved in... You know, early stage 
business marketing and development, strategic development. Yep. So yeah, quite a quite a good mix. And then obviously software developers that have come from, uh, I would say, platform based technologies. Okay. As yep. well, which is replicable, but just in a different market, which is great. Which is exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So, uh, what have your kind of been key, yep. key milestones to date? Kind of what have you what have you been main achievements? What you've been quite proud of, or kind of what's so, gone particularly well. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, a key milestone back in the day was actually original C certification. Yep. So approved approve that this is a, you know, a, a software as a medical device yep. at that stage. Um, subsequently, I would say that one of the keys uh, milestones actually, it sounds terrible to say that COVID actually changed this business, but it fundamentally did. Okay. We went from looking at a product that would actually be there to disrupt what is in the um in the clinical environment in an opticians mm-hmm. to, well, what if we could do this remotely? Okay. So we, I, I hate the word pivots, but we transitioned or had a paradigm shift. That's yep. maybe an <laughs> even fancier way of saying pivot. That's a big um, word, big, big phrase. It's, it's yeah. a big way to say the same yeah. thing, isn't it? We shifted um, into an alternate space where we went, well, actually, what if we could do the majority of these tests remotely? Mm-hmm. So we are now a teleoptometry platform Excellent. and, and a one of its kind, if you like. So fundamentally, the ability for you or I to sit at home and be able to engage with your clinician who may be remote, yep. but on screen, a little bit like we're doing now Absolutely. with Zoom, but yep. with the tests embedded. And I'd say that was one of the biggest, biggest shifts in our business. And the milestones was shifting this so that patients could be in the comfort of their home clinicians could be in the comfort of their home i guess yep. but in a clinical environment and they can interact with their patients and if you is that uh, i guess is the kind of a key driver for that to uh create less well i guess not less travel but clients don't have to go into the clinic clinic all the so, time you can see people who are based remotely or you can see people who may be infirm who can't get into clinician it's the clinical yeah. space is that is that fair yeah, it is. I think um, the, the, one of the key things is accessibility. Mm-hmm. So that's not just accessibility from a patient perspective, but it's from a clinician perspective. Sure. We know that healthcare globally is um, challenged with a bottleneck of uh, clinical expertise and resource being available. Okay. So how do you alleviate that pressure on the market at the same time as if you think about you or I that might have a day job yep. and uh, being told, oh, could you come in to the optician at two o'clock on Tuesday is not convenient, yep. right? However, if you could actually do that remotely at a more convenient time with the clinician remotely, the clinician doesn't lose time yep. in travel. Yep. The clinician also doesn't lose time in lost opportunities as in no shows, Okay, yep. but more importantly, the patient or the customer first, customer centric aspect means that you can access healthcare on your terms when you need and want it. A little bit like we do with our banking, with yep. other areas of healthcare, with pretty much anything in our lives, it's all been digitized and you go digital first. Yep. That's what we're bringing to the market. And that's what we believe is the major disruption in this industry. And I was going to say, I guess yeah, as you touched on yeah, a lot of other areas of medicine is, is moving that direction possibly not quite as quickly as, as yourselves ibis vision but uh, yeah other areas are yeah. moving to kind of uh, more accessible uh, uh, treatment and, and care i guess um yeah so you kind of you kind of mentioned covid um as has kind of been one of the key drivers for, for that 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 paradigm shift um mm. I'm not going to use the word pivot now. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's a, that's a new <laughs> motto of mine. Um, yeah, but what kind of challenges as a business have you faced? I mean, that was obviously, COVID was a challenge for so many businesses. So, but yeah, what other challenges have you faced as you've kind of uh, gone? I on? think, uh, move that to one side, because that's a yep. global challenge yep. for a whole load of different reasons. The challenges specific to our business yep. have actually been the environment we're working in. Okay. Um, and with utmost and all due respect to the sector we're operating and serving, uh, they are exceptionally conservative mm-hmm. and disruption is not a word they like to hear. Sure. Um, and I think that's fair clinically across many areas of clinical disciplines. Yep. However, I would say in the ophthalmic world, to me, it, it appears to be even more so. Okay. You know, disrupting the norm is not something they're comfortable with. So yep. some of the biggest challenges have been winning the hearts and minds yep. of those that are serving their customers because they've been used to doing it in a certain way for so long yep. and there hasn't been much technical innovation. That visual field, the yep. clicker test I was referring to, is I think over 30 years old. Yep. And that was, yeah. probably, that was probably the biggest uh, biggest disruptor for, for probably another 30 years before that. 
Exactly. Yep. Uh, you've got it. So bringing in something new, it's I'd say one of the biggest challenges for our business is the industry we're operating in. And in particular, healthcare in the UK yep. has so many barriers and challenges okay. to, to enter that space with accreditation, compliance, validation, yep. that um, arguably if you can do it in the UK, you can almost do it anywhere. Yep. And it's seen as a gold standard for global adoption, which is why we're transitioning into the US market. It's, and I guess that's the US market is more flexible, more competitive. So there's more competitive advantage for individuals. Is that all fair? Yeah, I think, well, we say more competitive, more flexible. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think the the way the US health market works, mm-hmm. uh, and again, this sounds a little bit crude, is it's all about the dollar. Yep. So it's how will I make money or how will I save money? Yep. And who's going to be responsible for paying? So it's a payer provider model yep. um, with private health care. And fundamentally, your insurance product either covers you for this or it doesn't. Yep. Or which panel can I use? Which one can't I use? So from their perspective, actually anything that they can bring in, which is a technological advancement, which allows them still to uh, get reimbursement or recharge to the insurance company. Yep. And the insurance company is confident and comfortable that it, it, it is applicable for a particular code. Yep. Then this sort of technology is something they're keen to look at and keen to adopt. So I think they're more receptive to innovation, but for different reasons. Yep. No, that's fair. I think that's fair. So I guess your steps in the US then are... Would it need to be FDA approved and then getting a PIC code? Is are those the kind of the, the so, steps? Um, you asked about milestones and yep. achievements, and one that I didn't mention, which is probably arguably the biggest, is we are actually already FDA approved. Awesome. And that came through a couple of months ago, yep. and we're approved in five different listing categories, Excellent. which is phenomenal. And yep. that's testament to our team and what they've been doing. And actually, based on what you may perceive to be our competitors Mm -hmm. who are providing not dissimilar things in slightly different ways um the biggest competitor in our space only has two listings okay so we're already coming to market with five listings under our belt ready to attack the u.s market and we've already got our first customer in the u.s so that's clearly a milestone absolutely and i guess you know having the more listings gives you more accessibility to insurance companies is that kind of how it works it gives us more accessibility it also gives us more uh, protection and freedom to operate okay so whilst we may be developing um a suite of tests down one route on yep. one listing um we can continue to operate the others concurrently so it's not all yeah all under one umbrella and it's an all or nothing it's you know, it's modularized, yep. if that's a word, um, let's, let's into the way in which we deliver that. I'll, I'll take that as a word. Yes, that's good. I'll take that. <laughs> you can um, have two now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So talking about the US, uh, I mean, you've recently uh, secured, um, you know, not insignificant funding from a, from a US-based VC. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a bit more, a bit more about that, why this particular funding partner is significant and, and what that means for you as an organization? Sure. I think I, I often use an analogy uh, here where I say that um, if you're applying for a job, you write the resume or the CV to the job you're applying for, right? Yeah, correct. Well, why should that be any different with your um, funder? Mm -hmm. So in that respect, what we were doing is we were looking for someone that was in the investment market, understood the sector we wanted to go into, um, that actually had experience there and were a support investor. So we started looking for that type of partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do say partner, and I know everyone talks about partnership, but it had to be for us. Um, we identified um, through connections uh, a partner in a company called Compiler VC down in Miami, mm-hmm. and they happened to have been the family that were behind uh, the Four Eyes chain, and the Four Eyes chain was sold to Grand Vision. Okay, and they had over I think 150 plus stores throughout the US, Fantastic. so they understood our market, they understood the sector we were operating in, they had already suffered the challenges or the pain points that we were looking to address so they got it yeah okay and they come with that expertise that black book yep yes the funding is essential but fundamentally what's more important is the brand association and the relationship that they bring to the table and how they can support us yep so we went after the right investor um to lead the charge into the u.s market and yep. to support us and then complement with our existing investment partners including deep bridge of course in the uk market Absolutely, and I guess you know, the key thing is they understand how ripe their market is for disruption, and I guess they could see where you fit into that kind of uh, that, that, that uh, ecosystem. 
Exactly. Uh, that, that's the point I'm making. They had, they had seen the challenges they had when they were an operator, yep. having sold that business and then said, had we had this, yep. we could have done that. Yep. So they knew the fundamental difference this sort of technology would have made to their operation and therefore investing in it, this at the sort of leading edge, I wouldn't even say bleeding edge anymore, at the leading edge of the market is um, a prime position for them to take a, a stake in the business. Brilliant. Brilliant. So is the focus going forward purely the US or are you still looking at the UK and, exp- and, and doing things here or is it now kind of move to the US and then kind of uh, and disrupt that market and then look beyond that or kind of what what's the next steps, I guess? So I, think, I guess, it you know, no surprise to you, it'll be a multi, multi-channel multi approach. Yep. Um, the UK is core to us uh, and has been. We've been working with the NHS for a number of years now and yep. continue to develop our product on that. Predicated on what I said before about the clinical validation, efficacy, compliance and everything else that exists in the UK market. It's a great um, accreditation or seal of approval mm-hmm. for international mm-hmm. markets. So yes, the US undeniably, but that's because of the way in which their healthcare system is set up and what we can do to address that. And, and the, sc- the scale of the US market will be significantly large in the UK as well, I imagine. Just on states yep. alone, was it 50 to one, yep. something like that? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's actually, I think the math works out to be 60 to 65 times the size of the UK market. Right. Bearing in mind the UK is the most saturated um, per capita market within eye care in right. the world. Wow. Um, so it gives you an idea of, of the potential of the US market as well. Um, but it's not just the US market. We're already active in India. We have a channel distributor in India. Um, and we have a couple of licenses. Uh, Malaysia, for example, okay. have just got FDA clearance for a platform there, uh, which are using our technology embedded in theirs as well. So we will be looking internationally, continuing from our core in the UK and Europe. Uh, but yeah, US is arguably our biggest next territory. And this might sound like a stupid question, but you know, in the US or elsewhere, other kind of uh, geographical territories, I guess the 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 size of the countries makes your proposition much more appealing i mean you know if you are you could be in the same state as your your ophthalmologist but you could be you know four or five hours commute away from actually going to see them i guess is is that fair that's spot on i mean if you look at you know state of texas yeah. <laughs> how much bigger than the uk's whole Absolutely. you know whole of the uk is that yeah. um and you're right it's it's about accessibility again so the ability to actually be able to go to um a clinic yep. might be prohibited by your geographical location. Yep. So if you can jump on, you can do the triage and the pre-qualification yep. and all of the things that you can do for an online assessment and then only have to go to the clinical environment where you need to do the full health check yep. and where you need to do things where you have to interact with the patient, uh, for example, looking at the back of the retinal, a retinal scan or um, a pressure test, the puffer test that some people yep. refer to as you know, that blowing the yep. air into your eye. You need to do that physically. We haven't worked out the technology to do that yet, uh, no. remotely. He says yet. I like that. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so kind of going back to kind of starting the business and growing the business, being a UK and a Scottish-based company, you know, what's what did the, e- the early stage ecosystem in the UK look like for you and, and do for you, I guess, in terms of, you know, not only grants, mm. but also kind of support and, and kind of, yeah, what, what did it look like for you, for you as the kind of the CEO of the business? So I think it's fair to say that starting a business in Scotland um, has a lot of benefits Mm -hmm. um, and therefore being in Scotland, we have access to an ecosystem called Scottish Enterprise, which I'm sure you're familiar with or your listeners will be. Um, And in that, there's a lot of support uh, mechanisms available, not just grants, but access to expertise to help you grow, nurture and develop a business. Um, without most respect to that, I perhaps had a little bit more experience than mm-hmm. a lot of people that would come originally. However, what I would say was it, it was through that ecosystem that the originators of the business, the founders of the business, were introduced to myself yep. through the Global Scott program. Yep. Um, so even in that, I probably wouldn't even be with the business now if, had it not been for this Scottish Enterprise and a Global Scott program. Yep. So that's a start. Yes, there are a number of um, support funding mechanisms, grant mechanisms in Scotland as well. However, uh, that's all the pros. I would say the cons, to be very polite... We we like cons as well. Yeah, is that Scotland, despite what, and I'll not get into the politics, despite (laughs) some political persuasions, might want it to be isolated. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, for businesses, particularly startup scale-up, is a very dangerous thing. I think... um, 
you need to cast the net wider and be willing to go elsewhere to identify not only your market, but also your route to finance. Uh, Because it's a great startup ecosystem in Scotland, even for investors. However, it's at a certain stage. And if you want to spread your wings, if you want to grow your business, you need to look further afield. You need to be in the UK. You need to be internationally. Or you're not going to outgrow, uh, sorry, realize the full potential. And you'll be stifled by, you know, the Scottish ecosystem. And I think, that's, um, I think that's not necessarily a Scottish thing as well. I mean, in terms of it will be because of, of size and scale, but, you know, the UK whole is, uh, is often referred to as a great place to start a business, but not a great place to scale a business. And I think you know, there's, there's mechanism being put in to, to kind of alter that, and we are seeing that change, but, but similarly maybe on a slightly bigger scale than Scotland in isolation. But I think that is still a, a fair point and something that... Uh, yeah, that, that we're I think if you, want, if you want the capital to um, seed a business... Yep. Yep, there's Scotland or indeed the UK. Yep. If you want capital to um, grow a business, mm-hmm. then you need to look wider than the UK. And if you yep. want capital to scale a business, unless you're in a sweet spot, then you definitely need to look outside the UK market. Yep. And I think that's the stages that we've been through as Ibis yep. Vision. Seed capital from the Scottish ecosystem, yep. followed on by some seed capital with the likes of Deepbridge in yep. the early days. As we headed towards growth capital, we then spread the net wider and then scale. Yep. So I think I think we're at the trajectory or the transition period rather between growth capital and scale capital. Yeah. Um, so we're you know looking to come good on the promises we've made by putting the team in place to deliver. Yep. And then the next would be rinse and repeat that sort of you know automated process of scale the Absolutely. business would be the next stage for us, which is the key driver to get to. So how did just should, uh, sorry, sorry Andrew yeah, I should yeah. should also put a, a note out to the likes of Innovate UK. Yep. Uh, and I think particularly during during the COVID period, Innovate yep. UK was a great um, support mechanism for a lot of businesses, Very along much. with a number of um, relatable Scottish enterprise support grant activity, which mm-hmm. we took advantage of, or yep. actually helped us keep afloat at the time, to be honest, and allowed us to do that transition into the business we are. So um, it'd be remiss for me not to to mention that they are fantastic um, assets that, again, we have in the UK, yep. um, which people don't realise don't actually exist in the rest of the world. No, and I think that's uh, I think that's the same for things like the Enterprise Investment Scheme and, and Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme and those kind of funding mechanisms. Well, and I think yeah, SEIS got, and EIS yep. again very unique to the UK market. Yep. When you try and explain that to your American inv- investors, <laughs> they say you get what? Absolutely. Why? How? They, they can't How believe do we it. get that? They can't well, you it. don't. No, but yeah. And I think yeah. you know, when you do talk to uh, investors or, you know, I've spoken to a couple of financial planners, I guess they call themselves, or wealth managers from the US, uh, you yeah, know, and they can't believe why, you know, why wouldn't people be doing EIS or SEI investing, SEIS investing? You know, it's, yeah. you know, it just doesn't make sense then when you say to people, well, actually, probably about 50% of IFAs in the UK actually look at EIS and, you know, probably only... Probably it's probably somewhere around fourteen percent of uh, you know investors in the UK, active investors in the UK, actually utilise EIS. They can't get their head yeah. on that. So, uh, but anyway, that's uh, think, digressing on the point. Yeah, I think the tax benefits are phenomenal, and uh, more companies need to take advantage of that, and more individuals need mm. to participate in it. Yep. That said, I would say right back at the early stage of Ibis Vision, yep. it was hard enough to raise thirty k. Yeah, when you get into the 300, 500, I would argue that that's easier. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's the same mechanisms to to deploy capital, regardless of whether it's thirty k or three hundred or three yep. million. Yeah, absolutely. In that regard, but if if we can work out a way to open up and actually, obviously, with the government increasing the SEIS allowance, which is superb, that's going to help a whole load of companies that need far more capital than they think they need. Absolutely. To be able to get to the next stage and get enough seed capital to realise potential to go back and look for that growth capital. I could I could talk on that subject all afternoon, so uh, I appreciate you. we're here for. I appreciate yeah, you've so got a job to do. But, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So, so kind of where on your journey did Deepbridge come in and kind of, uh, you know, how did you come across Deepbridge? Why Deepbridge? You know, those kind of questions. Mm. You want me to be polite, right? Be polite, yeah, please. Only joking. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. So I think it goes back to the point I was making about writing yeah. the CV. Yeah. I guess we were doing that from the very beginning. Yes. Um, getting a couple of um, high net worth individuals or early angels on board was one thing. Complementing yep. that with s- some Scottish enterprise support grant funding was another thing. Yep. But we needed to play with the big boys. And if we were going to scale the business, we needed to show that we were worth investing in. Absolutely. How better to do that than to get a, even if it's an early stage, get an early stage VC on board. Yep. So um, Deepbridge, uh, I, 
don't know how early in the Deep Bridge journey we were, but we we would have been pretty damn early Fair in your in our life scientists. You know, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I think identifying a a fund that had aspirations to do things in life sciences or yep. technology in healthcare yep. was key to us, and seeing that the the mindset of those leading it kind of were aligned yep. and passionate enough to make a difference in healthcare, not just by deploying capital and running, Absolutely. but by actually wanting to participate. And DeepBridge felt like they ticked that box uh, in the initial phases and then also gave us the freedom to to operate, but also had the whip when we needed it as well. <laughs> um, and I think that's um, a polite way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure uh, many of your portfolio could relate to that analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's fair. And I think, and I, think I think it's that relationship pretty, that you know, I mean, you've been there and done it before, Mark, and things. It's that relationship that the funder and founder will always have. Is that it's got to be a constructive relationship, you know, and it's got to you've got to work uh, well together, and you know, you've got to you understand when, you know, from our perspective, I guess, when we need to ask questions, and from your perspective, you know, when to push back and, and things like that, and it's, uh, it's it's an ongoing relationship. Yeah, I think it is. And just a, a word of warning or a word to the wise mm. um, or yet to be uh, for founders that might be either listening to this or thinking about bringing a VC on board. I think, uh, again, being very polite, you've got to remember that a VC there is to get a return on investment. Yep. Um, and fundamentally, they're there to make money. Mm-hmm. And therefore, if, um, if there are challenges at a board level, yep. don't think that they won't be willing to actually crack that whip Mm -hmm. because it's important they have a job to do as well yeah and yes they want to be supportive yes of course deep bridge want to be supportive it's part of you know the fundamentals of your business but at the same stage it's not the only thing you're there to do absolutely um and some founders need to realize that they might be there at the beginning of the journey and ibis vision is a perfect example and they can be there at the end of it but maybe just not in the same Yep. same rule That's so know when to step aside and let other people take control um and when you've outlived yep. what your value to the business is transition into where you add the greatest value and bring in other people around you yep. that are better than you at what they do and i would say that's what i'm doing right now in yep. fact i would argue that most of my team are far better than me at what they do um and are perfectly capable of running this business moving forward make yourself redundant as quick as you can i would say <laughs> is what you want to do but most people don't really I think it's. I think it's that old adage that you know. I think we've, we've probably all learned. We've all been taught at some point is that you know you should always when you're hiring is bring people in that are smarter than you and work with people that yeah. are smarter than you. And I think, uh, but it's yeah. but it's 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 kind of for a lot of people that kind of goes against human nature. And I think that's uh, I guess you know once you've got somebody who understands that, then that makes uh, the whole journey a lot easier. Um, True. I was I was going to ask you a question about what advice you'd give to entrepreneurs, um, but you've kind of answered that already as, a, as kind of a key advice. Anything else you want to add as kind of pearls of wisdom, or, or is that your kind um, of key driver? How long have we got? I think, <laughs> I think uh, this, uh, just to, to go over some of the ground we've already covered, mm. I would say that, uh, and I can't help but use it again, is write the resume or the CV to the job yep. you're applying for. If you're looking for capital and you know Everyone thinks the only capital you need is your first investment. Yep. I can pretty much tell you and guarantee you from experience, it's highly, highly unlikely. Yep. And therefore, you need to think about the type of investment you're going to need and when you're going to need it. Yep. And make sure at the early stage, you don't muck up your cap table by taking the wrong type of investment or doing side deals with different types of um, side notes, if you like. Yep. I'm dumbing it right down, forgive me, on, on the types of things that you're offering to original or or originating investors because that's going to make it almost impossible for real capital to get involved in your business so think about that trajectory and what you need to achieve and how you're going to get there and listen listen to people they're there to support you don't ignore uh the advice from people that have been there and done that i think uh you've you've echoed kind of uh, certainly i was involved in a, a round table conversation uh with another number of vcs and some of the support agencies you've just previously mentioned uh, just last week mm. and that was i think one of the key things that came out of that was the importance of an education for founders about understanding future funding rounds the impact of those funding rounds and actually how you need to stop from those from day one and understand what that journey looks like rather than just thinking right i'll go and raise my first hundred thousand pounds or five hundred thousand pounds or a million pounds whatever it is it's okay what's next what's after that and what does that look like and i think that's uh, exactly that's yeah. exactly 
Mark, we, we, we like in these um, in these podcasts to bring to life the people behind the companies as well. So, uh, you know, just you know, on a personal note, outside of uh, managing a, a scale of business that's uh, rapidly growing internationally, um, you know, you probably don't have much personal time, but, you know, kind of what are your personal interests away from, from the desk? Yeah, <laughs> what's personal time? <laughs> I guess, obviously, uh, everyone's going to say it, but family, I have a couple of yep. uh, relatively young kids that are growing up too quickly, so... Yep. I took the decision years ago to, you know, dedicate more of my life to actually be involved in the startup scale up. Yep. Um, crazy thing to do, so I could spend more time, you know, seeing the kids grow up. And how did um, how so, did that work out? Um, I'll, <laughs> you best to ask them. They never see me, so yeah. no. Um, well, the fact that I can work from home now and again is yep. is testament to the fact that the flexibility that's Indeed. offered by this sort of role works for me. Uh, but yeah, you know, mostly spending time with the. Uh, the family, I'd love to say have loads of hobbies like golf and everything else, but to be honest, um, other than work, it's probably um, yeah. stuff around the family. That's I like, you know, windsurfing, paddleboarding, these sorts of things. Awesome. Bit of active, like a bit of running, trying to keep fit, but yep. I emphasize the trying to keep fit. But, um, but yeah, no, Good. it's not um, it's not as glamorous as I I probably would like to tell you no no you but uh, you know that's uh, that's for down the line There's still plenty of time but all good um yeah. then one question we ask all of our guests on the deep Wish discovery podcast is about the deep Wish dinner party so we always ask all of our guests to uh, to invite three guests dead or alive but no family or friends we don't upset anybody um so you know invite them to the deep Wish dinner party who would your three guests be and why hmm just a good question. I saw I saw this in the preamble of who who would you invite, and I guess I've been thinking on this for the last few hours. <laughs> um, you know, it, it would be interesting. And sorry, this is going to sound boring uh, because so. uh, I'm probably coming more from the investment side, which mm-hmm. is maybe what you want to hear. But someone like Warren Buffett okay. would be yep. really interesting. Yep. I think because you know his wisdom, his financial acumen. You know, it would actually make for quite an engaging evening mm. uh, of investment related. And I'm sure he's got some right howlers in there as well, which he doesn't really tell you about publicly. So no. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. No, when you go to the, when you go to, philosophy. when you go to the horse races, nobody ever told you about the ones they don't lose. That they, they, they lose rather, do they? That's uh, yeah, it's always exactly. But that's where all the learning's at, right? So I'd love to, Indeed. yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about him on round the dinner table as opposed to presenting. Yeah, that would be interesting. I and think I think with Warren Buffett though, as well for. for Warren Buffett, from my perspective as well, it, I think it'd be really interesting to see what he believes has changed in the world of investments over the last 20, 30, 40 years and what has stayed exactly the same. Because I'm sure there's some things which we think are really unique now, which are actually probably yeah. happening 30, 40 years ago, but just in a different guise. But. I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear what he thinks about, you know, he's, he's, he's often, you know, pioneer sort of value investing, long-term wealth creation. Yep. And I'd like to understand where he feels the sort of emerging technology and innovation plays in that. Yep. He's traditionally really only invested in, you know, um, top 100s, mm-hmm. really established yep. businesses that he can see a nice trajectory for. Yep. How does he feel that the emerging technology sectors yep. can actually disrupt and make a difference? And at what point would he see as the the trigger point for uh you know the hathaway the berkshire hathaway fund to get involved in something like that or no, how would that happen no no, no um, absolutely. i'd be really interested to hear how we what you think about that no nope, absolutely that'd be fascinating so number two um other end of the spectrum cheryl sandberg okay intrigues me yep um you know um uh, very um powerful uh female mm-hmm. uh i'm gonna say still an entrepreneur to the extent that coming in and dealing with I say dealing with in a bad way, someone like Mark Zuckerberg as the yep. COO yep. in a business that is fundamentally the Mark Zuckerberg show or yep. perceived to be, you know, she's known for leadership skills, being able to, to, you know, handle that dynamic between inventor creator yep. and a business that needs to scale. Yep. Um, she's done some phenomenal stuff. I don't know if, if anyone's read lean in, yep. um, the women work in, was it women work and will to lead i think it's called um that's that's a really interesting read and doesn't matter whether you're into women empowerment or um you know leveling up in the in the workplace or not it's a phenomenal uh, book to read and i'd recommend it to anyone um and i'd love to hear her thoughts on on what's going on in the market and in the 
you know, in the digital world particularly. And I think, you know, that her, that challenge that she's got is is not unique, just that organisation. There's so many organisations out there that have been founded by an individual and it's how do you actually help them delegate responsibilities and take things off their desk to, to for the better good of the organisation? It's what I'm allowing them to do what they do best yep. so others can do what they do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And number three? Again, similar, Peter Thiel. Okay. Yep. So renowned entrepreneur, venture capitalist, but he co-founded PayPal, so he's part of that mini PayPal mafia. Yep. Um, you know, he's he's a bit contrarian. He thinks bold about his investment decisions. You know, he's got a lot of insight about startups, innovation, and the future of technology. Yep. So I think he would make for a phenomenal deep bridge dinner party guest. I was going to say, again, somebody's been um, there and done it. Yeah, he's been there and done it, and uh, yeah, exactly uh, those stories. That he's been, been, been there and done that and doing it again and again. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I think the combination between the three of them, I'm sure they've probably been at the dinner table before, and maybe we just <laughs> need, to, have, yeah. we need to wing an invite to their dinner party, not the other way around. I was going to say, um, this, this is, you've brought a whole new dynamic to the Deep Wish Dinner Party now. This is about who we need to be getting invited to rather than inviting them to our dinner yeah. party. But yeah. Sorry, they're all the, they're all the grown-up answers and yep. probably the most sensible ones uh, that would be palatable for the podcast. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think that genuinely they would be my three. Yeah, brilliant. That it. Very interesting and uh, yeah, fascinating conversation. Look, Mark, I could talk to you all afternoon. I could uh, you know, talk to you uh, all day about various things we've covered, but uh, I found that really interesting and hopefully our listeners will. So thank you very much for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining this latest Deep Discovery podcast. If you have any topics you'd like covering in future podcasts, please email us at discovery at deepbridgecapital.com. This podcast was brought to you by Deep Bridge Capital LLP. Deep Bridge is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Please note that investments discussed are both illiquid and high risk and won't be suitable for all investors and should be considered as part of a diversified portfolio. The content of this podcast should not be construed as financial or taxation advice. We recommend investors seek appropriate professional financial advice. Any views expressed may no longer be current and may have already been acted upon.